River Woman, that is a classic intro. Sure. And get into maybe some of the details that uh, you can walk us through about gear, the sessions, and so forth. Absolutely. Right. This was the guitar that was used. This was it. The this Valley was, Arts. Yeah. And you, so you said that they, you did 50 different variations of that intro. Well, the, when we did the date, there was nothing written, and you know, the, we had chord, cha chord changes for the tune. And, you know, like, I was, hey, play a little intro or something, you know. So I probably played a, you know, just off the top of my head because, you know, I said, okay, I, you know, didn't have too much time to put thought into it, which is sometimes good, you know, yeah. you the spontaneity. But, uh, yeah, I played a few different ones, and that seemed to be the one that made the record for some reason. <laughs> for, I mean, you were kind of the guy for Lionel Richie for his string of, like, just huge records for pretty much spanning a decade. Oh, wow. uh, and I always just love that sound. I, I always assumed it was some sort of strat. I had no idea that it was a Valley Arts, although I guess it should have made sense given the time. Every right. session guy uh, of of a certain level, especially that of yours, was using Valley Arts. Yeah, Mike was making guitars for everybody. What was like? What is the story behind this particular guitar? This was used on other Lionel Richie sessions, I presume, as well. Oh yeah, this was used on. This was my main strat for all that era, you know. And we'll get more into those particular songs, but just tell us about this guitar, just so we kind of know. Well, Mike McGuire at Valley Arts uh, back in the day when they were on Ventura Boulevard uh, put this together for me. He was making them, and this is number twenty-five. Wow. That he's made. It says on the back there, and uh, I just said, Mike, go. You know, he made. Uh, his his things that he wanted and he put a very hard maple neck nice ebony fingerboard and it's rosewood like we we're talking about yeah rosewood body yeah which makes it heavy but you know it's it's manageable and it's just a turned out to be a great guitar it's, i have a theory about guitars that you can get all the best ingredients you can think of and put them together but if they don't really work together it doesn't work and you can yeah. get some marginal inexpensive guitars that just sync together all the, the neck and the body the woods and yeah. the whole thing I might be all wrong about that, but it seems no. like that's how they interact, you know. I mean, you're you're taking dissimilar species of woods that come from potentially different continents, and you're gluing them together, yeah. and it's it could be like swinging at a pinata, you know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why, especially, uh, it's apparent with acoustic guitars. It seems you play five of the same exact guitar, and they're going to be five different guitars. Absolutely, There's similarities, but you know, that's. That's the nature of the guitar. Did, but yeah, Mike made this. Did you have a lot of influence over like what he put? Like, did you say, I want EMGs, I want a mid boost, I want the ebony board and the rosewood body and the the bird's eye maple neck? Or was you know, it... I think I left a lot of that to him. We he kind of knew what I wanted. I didn't want anything unusual. And it was pretty much a common thing. The mid range boost, um, we probably spoke about that. Yeah, because that's good just to get a little more hitting the amp a little harder and yeah. getting that thing. Um, especially with a you know just a single coil EMG, yeah. so that beefs that up. Um, and then of course the Floyd was a big thing when they first the very first guitars that he made, um, they didn't have the tuning. Uh, oh, like, oh, like the little micro tuners. Yeah, kind of, yeah, and it was oh it was brutal because you get the guitar nice and tuned and you crank these up, and then it twists everything so yeah. these go flat, this goes sharp, and and then you got to really. Compensate when I'm tuning this string because I know I'm going to tune this. You know, it was yeah. a real challenge. Then this came in shortly after and saved all that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody seemed to use these, and it it seems like all when we were talking with Paul Jackson, uh, he has a rosewood strat, really heavy one from yeah. Valley Arts. It seemed like people weren't afraid of the heavy strats back in the '80s. No, no, I didn't even think about it to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, it was just. I, the weight didn't even occur to me so right. much, but I knew it wasn't going to be ridiculous. It turns out to be a real hit maker after all. It was a great guitar. Yeah, it is a great guitar, I should say. Yeah. So this was the guitar that was used on Deep River Woman. What about for amps? Do you remember anything about what you used for that? You know, I've had so many, well, you know, half a dozen different rigs. I think at that time, there's a good chance I was using a couple of Fender, the the newer ones that they made in that with the Blackface um Deluxe and the Vibralux, I think. Uh -huh. And and they made Paul Rivera probably modded them up a little bit for me. And uh and my gosh, I can't remember I think the pedal board I had was one of the first ones Paul Rivera made for me, mm -hmm. which had a Mutron biphase. It kinda built along the side of the chair. 
uh-huh. and and I had all my foot stuff here, and then the biphase, and it, it was a cool little board, and all the buffers and stuff like that. So. Yeah, yeah, he was the the godfather of the pedal board at yeah, that time. Yeah, but it was that I probably had the original chorus, the Roland, the CE one. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you suspect yeah. that was what was on that intro originally for the most life, likely for deeper for women. Most likely, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess I can't be sure, but I'm pretty sure that's that's probably what it would have been. Yeah, right yeah. It's an, I mean that that clean tone on there is is always amazing, and it sounds yeah you know, super stratty, beautiful cleans, and then all of the all of like the fills that you do in it are also just like really gorgeous. The tone works really good with the track and with Lionel's piano and stuff. Uh-huh. And he was just, playing the piano on it. Yeah, yeah. That's he, him. He played it, and the good thing about um, rec- recording with Lionel is he would. Most often, almost always sing the song while we were tracking. Really? At least in the beginning, maybe not every single time, but for the most part. And that, boy, that was the whole thing, because so many times you go in and do a record and you don't really have an idea of what you're backing up. Yeah. You know, they, well, we're going to put the vocal on later, and, you know, it, it, it works, you deal with it, and, and but it's there's nothing like hearing the real vocal, so you get a complete thing of, of what you're accompanying. You know, and was he in the room with you? Was that done live, or would yeah. he... a lot of those we did it, yeah, that was, we did it at A&M, I think it was... Um, uh, let's see, maybe Paul Lyme may have been on drums. Uh, who would have been on bass? I forgot who else was on the session, actually. But, yeah, we did them, did them live, and Lionel would then be in there playing really? and singing with us, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure if he kept his, what he performed at the, right. you know, he just played Rhodes or sometimes piano. But, yeah, we did them live. Those so he was a legit good. musician. I mean, he could really play. Oh, yeah, he yeah. was good. You know, I, yeah, he, he was a legit musician, a learned musician, but he had the intuitive... Part yeah. two. You could learn all you want, but if you don't have that yeah. musical instinct, it doesn't mean much. 